What do you reckon, Tom? I think we should get started. Look at all these people. I reckon we should get started. All right, let's do it. Well, once again, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for joining our ASC, Australian Science Communicators Career Event. Um, I am seriously excited about the people that I have the great honour of introducing you to today. We have an incredible panel. You are in for an absolute treat. Um, but I'll begin by introducing myself and saying, hello, my name's Jen, Jen Martin. I get to be your host today. Uh, I'm an associate professor at the University of Melbourne. I founded and lead the science communication teaching program there. Uh, I'm also Dr. Jen on 3RRR radio here in Melbourne. There's nothing I like better than talking about science. And I have the great privilege of being vice president of the Australian Science Communicators. I defer here to wonderful Tom, who is on the line, who is one of the co-presidents. Tom is going to be running uh, all of the um, very important tech for us today. So give us a wave, Tom. I don't know if people can see Tom. Yes. Thank you so much, Tom. Before we continue, of course, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining you today from the unceded land of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nations. And I do want to pay my respect to their elders past and present and to all First Nations people who are joining us today. And I recognise the unique place that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people hold as the original owners and custodians of the continent of Australia. And of course, in the spirit of why we are all here together, I want to acknowledge that our First Nations people were our first scientists and our first storytellers. So thank you again so much for joining us today. This event is all about you having the opportunity to hear from some, from some really truly exceptional, I started saying extraordinary and then decided to make it exceptional halfway through, but some extraordinary people working in science communication and to have the chance to ask the questions that you want to ask as you think about where you currently are in your career, where you might be heading, and to get some idea of the incredible diversity of jobs that people who consider themselves as science communicators do. But before I introduce you to our amazing guests, I just want to explain how things are going to work. So I'm going to introduce you to each of our speakers one by one, um, but I am not going to read out their bios, partly because they've all got way too many accolades to their name. They're just amazing people and it would take too long and you'd all get bored listening to me say, ah, oh, and then she won this and then he won this and then she did this. Um, but also because I'm guessing that many of you probably read the bios that we've been sharing on social media. So rather than me wasting your time reading those things, instead I'm going to ask each of our guests to share just really briefly, they know they've only got five or six minutes, a little bit about what they do in their job or jobs in some cases and you know what kind of led them to that role and obviously each of them could talk for hours about that it's going to be a short version short and sweet but I just um, hope it'll be enough to give you kind of some insight to think about the sort of questions that you want to ask which really is the whole point of this event so there's going to be two different ways that you can ask questions. The first will be that once we've heard from each of our speakers, we're going to have about half an hour, a little bit less, depending on uh, how we go for timing, but we'll have Q&A all together in this main room. So please put your questions in the chat as we go. Don't wait till you've heard from all speakers and then you've forgotten what you wanted to ask the first one. Put your questions in the chat as we go and I'll do my very best to um, remember them, put them in some sort of order uh, so we can get to as many of them as we can. If you really want to ask your question yourself rather than typing it out, then just put a cue in the chat and maybe let me know who your question is for if it's for a specific person so then I can call on you. And of course, you may have questions that you want to ask everybody, but we're just going to have to manage our time the best we can. Then after the shared Q&A, we're going to move into two 15 minute breakout room sessions. Essentially, each of our speakers will have their own separate little party room and you're going to need to choose just two of them that you would like to have the chance to hear a bit more from or ask some more questions of. And we're going to ask you to please stay in that same room for the whole 15 minutes rather than trying to jump around because we want those rooms to have a really great conversation. But then we're also going to ask you to please go to two different rooms rather than spend the whole two 15 minute blocks picking the brains of the same person because we want people to have, you know, we want you to hear from uh, two different people with diverse careers, but also we want our speakers to have the chance to meet different members of our community. 
So basically just listen carefully as we go, think about the questions you want to ask. All of these speakers are amazing, but they've got really different careers. And so you need to decide who you would most like to learn more from. And we will be bringing you back into this main room in between the two breakouts so we can rejig the breakout rooms so I can remind you of all this then. But um, hopefully that all makes sense and I can stop talking now so you can hear from the stars of today's event. So. Let's get started. First of all, it is a great pleasure to introduce you to Belinda Smith, otherwise known as Belle. Um, I've had the wonderful good fortune of interacting with Belle for a few years now. Um, Belle, welcome and tell us, what do you do at the ABC? Hey, thanks, Jen. Um, so I'm the online science reporter for Radio National, which seems a bit like a bit silly, given that it's online for a radio station. But that means that I write for the ABC News website. I make radio packages for Radio National. Uh, I also talk on the radio for local. Um, and I do a little bit of TV as well. So it's a real mix of things. It's mostly online. Um, but as the ABC moves to a more digital first model, uh, there'll be more of that sort of cross-platform stuff as well. So, yeah, and I cover all science. So it's I'm quite fortunate in that respect. I'm working on a story about menopause and chimpanzees. Uh, and then I had a story published today about um, the Marshall Islands and how they're mitigating future droughts. So it's a real mix of things. That um, They both sound like amazing stories that I want to ask you more about, but I won't. That's <laughs> not the point here. Um, Belle, I know also when I receive my ABC Science emails, often you are the author of those emails and your job <laughs> is to kind of sum up what's happening in terms of science stories at the time. Is that one of the joys of your job, that you get to really be on top of kind of what's happening across all fields all the time? I mean, how much of your time are you spending reading press releases and trying to get your head around what's going on in the world? of science yeah look it's a bit of a double-edged sword like it's nice to know what's going on but then it, there's a lot of science as you know there is just a constant stream of papers being published and then you know as we've seen throughout the pandemic publication by press release if I have to write another article about a vaccine based on a press release from Moderna I'm going to tear my hair out <laughs> um, but you know like so yeah I mean I, I to be fair I, when I go on holiday, I just turn off completely and I just separate yep. myself from the entire news cycle. Uh, yep. But it is quite nice to really immerse yourself in this sort of one one subject area, this beat, I guess, as you call it. Yep. Um, it does mean, though, that when you're at trivia and a science question comes up and everyone looks at you and you don't know the answer, <laughs> it's the worst feeling. <laughs> Belle, how could you not know that? <laughs> Um, so I guess, uh, Belle, I'm imagining that lots of people listening going, oh, my God, I want that job. Like, how do I get to be a science journalist? I thought there were no dedicated science journalists in Australia anymore. Can you tell us briefly, you know, what got you to this position of having such an exciting role? Oh, briefly. Uh, well, I thought I wanted to be a scientist and then I did my honours and then I realised I wasn't actually very good at doing the science. I loved science. I still love science. But the actual research side of things just wasn't for me. Uh, so I, this is a bit of, yeah, so I used to work at a pub on Ligon Street here in Melbourne and um, the ex-bureau chief for the Australian was a regular and he was on the receiving end of some of my emails when I was overseas and he said, you should uh, think about becoming a journalist. And so I thought, oh yeah, maybe I should, but I didn't really want to go and do another three years of study. I'd already done a double degree plus honours. So I just did a one year grad dip at RMIT and that got me an internship at the Oz which, you know, once you get a few bylines under your belt, that sort of opens more doors. And then I spent the next eight years sort of working myself my way sideways through various media organisations until I got uh, my foot into the door at the ABC. And so that's how I got to where I am now. And, and am I right that science journalists are very um, few and far between these days or is that a story that I've heard and believed? without well, evidence <laughs> the, well there's the yes so science journalists by title the, we, we're a dying breed however there are a lot of journalists that write about science so I like yeah. I don't I really I'm not a big fan of science journalists business journalists sports journalists yeah sure you're a journalist but you just cover a topic and you apply the same journalistic principles regardless of what subject topic beat that you're covering so yeah I mean part of my job at the ABC is 
other journos might be covering a, a, a study that's come out of their patch. They'll come to me and say, do you mind if I take this on? I'm like, oh, it's cool. And so they'll write it up and I will give it a first pass just to make mm -hmm. sure that, you know, they've got everything right. They've linked to the study. They've got an external expert. The science is sort of, you know, accurate. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, a part of my job as well, which I, I really love um, kind of fostering that because it's important and mm -hmm. more journalists should be writing more science. Yeah, absolutely. You've you've kind of preempted what my last question was going to be, but I'll ask you again anyway. Um, and that is, what's your favourite part of your job? And and um, heads up to all of our guests today. I'm going to ask each of you if you want to start thinking, need a bit of thinking music. What is the your favourite part of your job, Belle? How about you? Oh, I don't know. Just the variation, yeah. just the the wide variety of stories. I don't. I just don't get bored. I can't get bored. Sometimes there's too much. And I mm -hmm. wish my brain would stop processing so much information. Um, and with each bit of information that goes in, a little bit gets pushed out, which is a bit of a shame. But, um, yeah, like I'm just never bored, never. And it's just that's what I need. I need that constant, you know, go, go, go. Well, on behalf of all of your listening and reading audience, thank you for being such a bloody great science journalist. Oh. I love it when my newsletter comes out and I'm <laughs> like it this week. It says, hi, this is Belinda Smith and today I'm writing about. So um, every time I hear you on the radio, I'm like, oh, I know her. She's so cool. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Belle, for making time to speak with us today. I'm sorry it's so short, but that's how we're that's how we're going. So if you've got questions for Belle, I can see Patrick's already put one in the chat. Please put them in the chat and think about if Belle is the person that you would like to chat further with. Um, as you heard, she's got a pretty interesting job. But it is now time for me to get excited to introduce you to our next speaker, who is Dr. Catriona Nguyen Robertson, otherwise known as Cat. So we've got Belle and Cat, which seems to go together very nicely. Um, I have the very, very good fortune of working with Cat a few days a week at Melbourne Uni, but Cat is a woman of many, many jobs and talents. Um, welcome, Cat. I, I can't wait to see how you're going to do this. Five minutes to tell <laughs> us. Tell us what you do, my friend. Uh, yeah, I think you. in summary, it's it's sort of, you know, jack of all trades, master of none type of thing. Oh, but um, <laughs> I'm going to argue with that right now. You are absolutely a master when you're working with me, that's for sure. Oh, thank you. Well, there, there we go. There, there are all my eggs in that basket. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I do have the delight um, of working with, with Jen and the University of Melbourne Science Communication teaching team, where we really just want to be training like lots and lots of science students because we think that it's important that scientists and science students know how to communicate their work to other people. So a big focus of mine is teaching them how to communicate to interdisciplinary audiences, because it's important as science gets more and more interdisciplinary and, and we need to work across fields to solve big problems, that we get people communicating with each other. So that's, that's one aspect. I, I take the tutorials for that and, and help out with classes. Um, another big part of what I do is working as a learning facilitator at ScienceWorks. And that's a really fun job working with many different audiences from babies. Like we had little kids day in yesterday, which is from zero to five. So working all the way with babies to adults. And um, mostly I present shows at ScienceWorks focused on the physical sciences, which is not my training at all. I'm an immunologist by training, but um, I'm learning lots. And I also partly do a little bit of work with their marketing and communications team as well here at ScienceWorks and Museums Victoria. So I create some of the social media content. And if you look at ScienceWorks' social media, I'm behind a lot of those posts. <laughs> um, and some of them are songs and things that sort of summarize different shows that we have or different exhibitions that we have. Um, and the third big thing I do is work for the Royal Society of Victoria with science communication and engagement. So there are two sort of aspects to that. The engagement is really trying to, to work with different partner organizations like Zoos Victoria, Museums Victoria, the Royal Botanic Gardens Victoria, and really trying to get them to do a lot of science outreach and work with communities, with libraries, with neighborhood houses and get science out there, really. Um, a big part of that is organizing National Science Week every year, but we try and have programs throughout the year. 
Um, and the other part of my Royal Society Victoria job is being an associate editor for Science Victoria, their magazine. And I edit lots of work that comes through and I really like supporting students who write and um, early career researchers who wanna give writing a go. But I also end up having to write a lot myself for it too. <laughs> Um, I feel exhausted just listening to all of that cash. Um, <laughs> I tried to go to work. You said I only have five minutes. <laughs> I mean, I, I do think it's remarkable all the things that you do. And you just talked about wanting to support early career researchers. You are also early in your career. So for those who don't know, Kat was a PhD student not too long ago. Um, you were still an active researcher until relatively recently. You know, you're in this amazing stage of, of um, well, A, being in really high demand, but also trying out all these different things to see where you want to be what are your what's your kind of thinking about being in this early career stage and having all of these um you know passions and skills but not having kind of one set career path that you're currently on well for me it's really fun because i rock up to each job and i do the fun stuff and leave the admin to someone else <laughs> like, like you um, <laughs> so she does lots of our admin that's not true um but as, as Belle said, in terms of the variation, like it means that I'm never bored. I'm doing so many different things and I love every minute of it. Um, also having a lot of fingers in different pies or whatever analogy you wanna go with, it means that I've really been able to work out what it is I like to do. And while I am early in my career, I am sort of thinking about, okay, one day I might have one thing that I commit to and one thing that I do and trying out lots of things is helping me kind of formulate what that might be. And and how important is kind of being able to have a whole lot of, you know, professional kind of organisational and time management and compartmentalisation skills? Like if someone's listening thinking, oh, that sounds awesome. I want to do different things every day of the week. Like it's not as easy as it sounds, right? How hard do you find that balance of doing different things? It means that I find myself writing a lot of to-do lists mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and thinking about, you know, what's the priority for each of my jobs. Um, it, it does also mean that I really need to think about how I manage my time and I promise I sleep and have a social life. People ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, really thinking about what is it that I need to get to do done today, but then also forward planning as well and working out what are the sorts of things that I need to be doing more urgently. Um, I do try and have separate days for separate things, but it doesn't always work out that way if, if things pop up. Mm. Yes, and I, I don't agree when you say you leave admin to other people. Certainly with me, you take on lots of admin, which I'm incredibly grateful for. And I'm guessing that the answer to my next question is not going to be admin. What's your favourite thing about what you get to do, Kat? Well, because I do different things, that's a really hard one to answer. But um, something that I absolutely love is when I see something sparked in a child or multiple mm -hmm. children. Um, after a show they've just something's clicked and they've got it or they have more questions and they want to know more or something's just really been a struggle for them to understand and then I've taught it to them in a different way from their teachers and they've got it and that's just yeah, yeah. yay oh that's so exciting I totally get that um, enormous thanks Kat there's already a question for you <laughs> about work-life balance, but we'll come to that later. Um, thank you so much for making time to join us. I'm really thrilled that you're here. And it is time to move on to our next speaker, who is Dr. Rachel Novak. And Rachel, I have to say, has been a really incredible mentor and supporter for me over many years. I first had the pleasure of interacting with Rachel back when I didn't even really know what science communication was, um, but I was a PhD student and I had the opportunity of being interviewed by Rachel when she was working for New Scientist. And I followed her career path ever since. And Rachel, oh my gosh, you've done a lot of different interesting things. I'm really looking forward to seeing how you're going to manage this five minutes as well. Um, welcome, Rachel. It's so great to see you. Maybe let's start with what you do now and then we can try and work backwards. Does that sound okay to you? That sounds great. And I was thinking about what I do now and I've got to make a big claim. So what I do now is help China get all its wonderful research out to the rest of the world. Okay. And I do that because I'm a senior editor at Springer Nature in the custom media team and if for APAC. And what I do is work, I have a team in China 
and we work with Chinese universities and academics, government departments, industry, um, putting out content and also running events where we invite both Chinese and overseas students to those, uh, overseas sorry, scientists to those events. So that's what I do now. Um, beautifully succinct. Thank you. Um, right. How many steps? Like, yeah, you you tell me. You're a really good communicator. There? So, how okay. about you decide the best way to tell the pathway of how you've got? Okay, together? so it was a long and winding pathway, which I think is <laughs> very typical. Um, I started out in a very uh, classic way, sort of really. Um, enamored with the natural world so I used to make little plaster casts of footprints you know it's probably my cat's footprints and then collect them all that sort of stuff went to university and studied um, physiology um, saw lights on in the lab at night and thought oh my god they're doing research I want to do that <laughs> I found out later it's actually the cleaning stuff um, but that um, pulled me in and I did my PhD I loved research. I loved the creativity of it, um, which, funnily enough, even though people think of writing as a creative endeavour, I think nothing matches doing research and creating new knowledge. Um, I left research, um, I mean, to be quite honest, there weren't many people that was that was young females in those days doing it, so I think it, there just wasn't a clear pathway for me. But I also, um, you know, I saw the positive and the negative and thought, well, I'm learning more and more and more about less and less and less. I love this stuff. I want to share it. And that's really what's determined everything else I do. And I think I um, have a real passion for sort of democratization of science, so partly sharing science, but also bringing people in. So I've worked in various roles where it hasn't just been about you know this really important job of translating science into a way that other people can understand it but also bringing people in so they can influence how we do science mm -hmm. it's not this is very winding isn't it so anyway so no, no, it's, I, i'm riveted i'm sure okay, so i did too. research and then i thought okay what next um and i thought i could be either a journalist or i could work in museums I was lucky enough to get into the Johns Hopkins writing program, which was basically a program for poets and fiction writers and creative nonfiction writers. And then they had sort of stuck on the side, the science writers, and we were really barely tolerated. <laughs> um, but it was a fabulous environment to really sort of enjoy writing and to sort of luxuriate in writing. So I did that for a year um, and then that enabled me to work in the States. And I just had um, a sort of series of lucky breaks, really, where um helped if you have a British accent in the States, I have to say, um, where I ended up working at Science and then New Scientist um, as a Washington Bureau Chief for New Scientist. Eventually, I'd done a postdoc here, so eventually I came back here as Australasian editor for New Scientist. And then after that, that was great, that was really good, um, I started doing more of the engagement and the consulting, so working with research organisations to help them really improve how they did research. And often for me, that means by bringing in the right people to help um, uh, sort of stress test the questions you're asking and to make sure the, the um, end users are represented. And... Um, yeah, eventually I got to here. Sorry, yeah, that's um, that's long. So yes, and, and yeah, you don't need to say sorry, Rachel. You are well within the time limits. I think you've done an excellent job. Well, anyone, would good... anyone would think you had some communication skills the way you just managed yeah. to be. You know, so I'm very succinct. good at judging fifty-five minutes because that's the length of a meeting. <laughs> Probably just start without even looking at a clock. Start packing up my books. Start... <laughs> but five minutes is a bit trickier. No, no, you've done remarkably well. Um, I mean, obviously, for everyone listening, you can see that Rachel's done all sorts of incredible things. But Rachel, if I was to ask you to sum up what your kind of goal has been, is it about making science accessible to different people? Has that kind of been the goal all the way along or something different? I think it's more than that. I think it's about this, when I say democratisation of science, this idea that it doesn't belong to it. Because I'm from a very working class background, okay? So, you know, first generation to go to university. Um, and I just think of all that untapped um, 
the sort of brain power that is out there that doesn't get into influence how we do science and doesn't have a voice in what science we do. I mean, it's got so much better. So I think that's what really drives me. And that's why I'm so passionate about my current job. I just love my current role because I see how um, researchers that speak English as a second language, how sidelined they often are. And so I'm really directly working to stop that happening. So it's really, that's what I really care about is, you know, I think this, this thing called science is, you know, it's one of the most incredible things we have. Some people, you know, I've heard it referred to as the sort of cathedrals of the 21st century. Mm. But this idea that it's something that is um, really enriching and just should be shared. So th- mm. that's what drives me. Yeah, I mean, obviously, anyone who knows me knows that I'm nodding in furious agreement and I couldn't agree more. Um, brief little anecdote, I was very lucky to attend the PCST Symposium in Venice recently. Tough gig, having I mean, to go to Venice. But one of the people that I met there, her, and I'd never thought about this job existing, although I assume it does all over the world, her job is to teach English to French science students so that they can communicate about their science effectively in English. And I'm sorry to be so naive, but I kind of went, ah, oh, I'd never really thought about the fact that if you want to be a scientist in a country where English isn't your first language, but you want to operate in the global world of science, of course, you need help to make sure your English is up to scratch. So she doesn't actually have a science background. She's a linguist, but she's become really immersed in science because of her job. And yeah, we had some fabulous conversations. So um, thank you, Rachel. I realise that was incredibly short, but you did an excellent job. Your My last question is just going to be the same for you of what's your favourite thing, let's say, about your current job. You've given us a pretty good idea, but... I can tell you my absolute favourite thing is top editing. And for people who don't know what that is, that's once the piece has been structured really well and it's all sort of in pretty good shape and the top editor comes in and just makes it perfect. And everybody thinks they're wonderful because they've made it perfect, but actually they've got the easiest job and the most fun job of the lot. (laughs) That's my favourite thing is top editing. Uh, Wonderful. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much. Um, Wonderful. Everyone is obviously thinking about all of the things that they could learn from speaking with you. And thank you so much to everyone who's putting questions in the chat. Um, There's lots of questions there. Tom is being wonderful and accumulating them all into a separate document for me and we will come to them soon. Um, But yes, keep putting your questions in. I can see Kat's already answered one, which is wonderful. But um, now I get to be so excited to introduce you to our next speaker, who is Dr. Simon Torek, who Well, Simon, you are a science communicator of many talents. Um, I've also had the pleasure of knowing you for many years. You've supported our teaching team many times. We love uh, working kind of with you, or at least we know of each other. But please tell us about Scientel and what you do there. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jen. And hi, everyone. Great to be part of this amazing panel. So, uh, so yeah, I'm the CEO and director of Scientel, which is a small science communication company our headquarters are in Melbourne. In uh, in this, our offices in the and in the um, RSV, the Royal Society of Victoria building. Um, so that's the the first link I'll make to one of the other speakers is Katrina's discussion about her work with RSV. Um, and Scientel is all about helping organisations and and researchers communicate their work so that it has more impact. So what we do is we start the source material might be a range of things. It might be a, a you know a new science. A, a, a paper that's just come out in, in a science journal. It might be a bunch of research reports. It might be just something in a, an individual researcher's head, in which case we'd interview them to, to get the story. It might be a whole team or a group of people who we need to pull together uh, and get what's out of their head by facilitating a workshop. Mm-hmm. And we then take the complicated information and we basically do what all science communicators do, translate it from techno-speak jargon into plain English. And the, the resulting product could be just like the source material could be a range of things. The resulting product can be a range of things from, uh, you know, a feature story to, to go somewhere. It could be um, uh, an animation or an infographic or a video, in which case we would work with specialist science communicators to, to help on that aspect. So we take complicated information of some form. We turn it into a communication product of some form. But really, science tells about that process of distilling, not even trying to summarise everything, but pull out the key important stuff so that it will have more impact. 
Um, obviously incredibly important stuff to be doing and thank goodness that you're doing it. So Simon, I'm interested to hear about that pathway for you of deciding to create Scientel, big step to begin your own business. And I know you've had immense success, you're growing, you know, it's all going wonderfully well, but presumably it was pretty scary at the start. So maybe what were you doing before Scientel that led you here? And for those who don't know, Simon is also a highly accomplished author, tons of books. How many books have you written now, Simon? I'm in too many to well, count. I authored 20 books with my business partner, Paul Holper. And yeah, so we, we founded Scientel exactly eight years ago. It's our organization's birthday this week. Woohoo! In 2015, that we formed Scientel, having worked together at CSIRO, um, but more importantly, in our spare time, written children's science books together, as well as a few textbooks and a few general readership science books. So we had that foundation of trust and knowing we had a similar writing style, a similar outlook on life, uh, similar values and, and everything. So that there was no real risk forming a business with Paul um, because we we knew each other really well. And, and as I say, we had that foundation having written books together. The really scary part was whether there was going to be anyone who wanted to employ us to do work. <laughs> um, but we have found that there are, there's you know, a lot of science communication work out there. Our clients are state federal government departments, universities and research centres and other uh, academic organisations within um, the, the university structures. Uh, and yeah, as everyone uh, on the panel and probably most of the people uh, who are listening in would know, there's a lot of people who want their communication facilitated in some way. And that's, as I described before, that's what we do. We help them get their research out there. Um, so that's what, that's back onto Scientel again, but I guess how we got there, a little bit about why Paul and I formed business together. Um, but how I got into science communication, I started off, I went to university to be a teacher because at school I really enjoyed explaining science and maths to my friends, if, you know, in, in the back of the classroom, sort of helping. And I didn't know there was a job called science communication. I just thought the job that involved explaining things was being a teacher. And so that'd be my first tip is to to follow, you know, not a pathway to a job, but a pathway to what you're doing what you enjoy doing. Um, so, yeah, so I went to uni, I started a PhD um, in climate change in the early 90s. So um, so that was when climate change was an, in, an interesting scientific question and research pursuit rather than a uh, big political football. <laughs> um, but it was starting to involve lots of communication. So I was doing a bit of communication, um, writing and talking about it on the radio uh, at Triple R, Einstein and Gogo. So that's my link to, to Jen there. Um, and But a, I guess a really key point in getting my interest in science communication was I was, um, I was at the Clyde pub near Melbourne Uni. So this is the link to Belle because she had a, <laughs> uh, an important part of her career. Um, me and a friend decided to have a look. It, it was when kids were going back to school and it was, as it seemed to us, always the case it was the hottest week of the year. So we managed to look at the data because I had all the temperature data for Melbourne as part of my PhD. And we ended up managing to prove in a day's work over a weekend that kids went back to school in Melbourne in the hottest week of the year. And that led to a, a front page article in The Age, an interview with Neil Mitchell <laughs> on the radio and even a Channel 7 interview. But I've done no media training at that stage. So that <laughs> running. But it did, that experience showed that what people generally were interested in this one day's bit of research was quite different to what scientists were interested in which is mm. what I was spending four years doing my PhD in and it made me realize that after my PhD I didn't want to pursue research but rather take that role of the liaison and and the mm. translator of research into what people are interested in. Mm which you, you know, have done incredibly well. And I know a huge number of people have learned those skills from you as well, Simon. So, um, so many more questions to ask, but I'm not allowed to. All I'm allowed to ask is uh, tell us about your favourite part of your job. Well, um, sorry, there's a bit of background noise at home. So tell me if I need to speak up. But, no, but you're fine. Like uh, the others, I'd say similar things like the variation in the job, um, uh, and, and so on is, is things that I like, but a couple of new things that I mentioned, um, maybe what everyone is also thinking is what they really love doing is talking to a scientist or a researcher about their interesting work and turning it into something that will have wide reach. That's what I, I just love hearing people's interesting stories and then helping them tell that story. So the interviews and perhaps, you know, facilitating a, a workshop and a group of people to hear 
people talking and then helping turn that talking into into a communication product is, is probably the most enjoyable aspect mm-hmm. from a science communication perspective. Uh, and also the, the surprising element of, of what I really enjoy about working uh, in Scientel is, is running a business. So that was something that I was a bit of a surprise. So started the, the business with Paul Holper. Um, it's grown, as you mentioned, we've now got uh, two other science communicators. We're actually about to start looking for, for another science communicator. Um, and, and running the business and all the elements uh, to that is, is really enjoyable as well. Mm, fantastic sounds terrifying to me running my own business so I'm so glad that you love it and you're clearly so good at it everyone's now thinking oh how do I get to know Simon so I can apply for that job um thank you Simon amazing really great to hear more from you and uh yes it is time to move on last but not least uh what a privilege for me to introduce Sonia Pemberton to you um I'm guessing many all most of you will have seen Sonia's name up on a very big screen up in lights um Sonia is currently joining us from Greece which I think is just the best because Sonia I know like everyone you're incredibly busy the fact that you've made time to join us um, from all the way over the other side of the world is wonderful Welcome. Please tell us about Gene Pool Productions and what you do. Hello. Hi, Jen. It's nice to be here. Um, yes, I'm a filmmaker, a science filmmaker. I run a company called Gene Pool Productions in Melbourne. Uh, we've been making science documentaries now for about 10, 12 years. Um, before that, I was head of specialist factual at the ABC, and before that, I was also a CSIRO. So there's a lot of things we've all got in common. Um, so Gene Pool Productions makes science documentaries for the global audiences, uh, and my focus really is to find the ideas, to put the teams together. I direct most of the films. Um, and I produce uh, all of them. Um, and sometimes I bring in new directors and I mentor some people to get their skills up so that we have more science communicators making long form uh, documentary film. So our films range from 55 minutes through to 90 minutes. Uh, we also make multiple part series. So recently we did Carbon, uh, the unauthorized biography, uh, Cracking COVID. We're about to release a phage film called Last Chance to Save a Life. Um, did Uranium Twisting the Dragon's Tail with Verit- Veritasium, Derek Muller, um, lots of films like that. Uh, so my focus is taking what I think are difficult, complex, contentious areas of science and delivering them as films for a mainstream global audience. And I'm hoping that everyone has seen seen at least one of your films, Sonia, and if they haven't, I'm hoping that they'll be able to find them. Um, I had the great joy of being at the opening night of um, Carbon. I can't remember when it was, uh, this whole COVID kind of time warp. It was sometime not that long ago. Yeah. 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 And, um, and, oh, my gosh, what, what creative, wonderful, amazing um, science communication. Well, that, that film's probably a good example of the nexus of what we try to do, which is mm-hmm. try and find a way to tell the story that's fresh uh, and different. So the story of carbon, we took a radical and not everybody agrees, uh, a successful point of view, and that was to give carbon herself a voice, to make carbon female and to allow carbon to speak and to tell her story. Uh, now, that's a very brave, unconventional, slightly naughty way to answer the more <laughs> element and hey I am totally aware of that um but that's what we try and do in all our films in your own twisting the dragon's tail the metaphor we used was dragons um in vitamania we use songs um in immortal we're a bit more straightforward about telomerase and telomere uh, biology but look we try to make things as visually dynamic and powerful as we can I think that's mm really the difference between the kind of science communication I do and perhaps what some other people do um, is that to sustain a film over 90 minutes, uh, you have to have lots of elements. You have to have story, you have to have the visuals, you have to have the audio, you have to have the characters, um, and you have to put all that together in a way that will translate that science to the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's really interesting because I used to make films specifically for Australian audiences and uh, that's very different to making films for a global audience. But I love it. I, I feel like I'm incredibly fortunate to be in this position and to find an idea that I think is interesting. And, and also because the time frame is so long, you know, we're talking two years down the track. So I have to be working right now on what I think 
might be interesting to global audiences in two years' time. Mm -hmm. um, the process of doing that is basically idea, uh, then I check market, uh, you know, what else is out there, because there's always other films on the subjects, these subjects. Then I've got to raise the money. We work at a million dollars an hour up. Um, so that's a big, big budget. But yeah, yeah, it's a whole different sort of scale. And, and I only bring that up so people get a reality check about how hard it is um, to raise that kind of money. Um, but then I put together all the deals around the world and then we write the script and then we make the film and then we distribute the film. So that's kind of the process. And we try, I focus now on much more boutique, like one film every year or so. I used mm -hmm. to have a large team of like 35 people. Um, we're down to four and I think that suits me better because I'm living in Greece half the year uh, that's <laughs> a priority um and uh but the focus really is to do a couple of interesting films one or two a year from here on mm -hmm. rather than at our busiest we had 135 full-time staff and um we were producing 18 20 hours a year and that was too much uh, so I'm I'm very happy really focusing on this kind of science communication Mm. Well, we're all happy that you are too, because what you're doing is remarkable. Um, Sonia, I'm aware that time is really short and it's probably not yeah. an easy thing to answer quickly. But what I, I guess what I really want to get to is the crux of is, you know, people people dream of having a job like yours, whether they've, you know, old like me and grown up with David Attenborough or you're younger and, you know, you've spent your life on YouTube, you know, making films, yeah. everyone knows is really rare and really hard like how on earth yeah. did you get to, to I mean I know you're really bloody good at it which is why you're doing it but you know how did you get there well I originally studied medicine my whole family is medical so I was interested in science from the beginning I did not complete my medical degree um uh I bailed out the first year because I went I'll kill people I'm not good at this <laughs> so one of the first things, one of the first things I, is to kind of know what you like and what you're good at and I meant to do journalism I wanted to be a journalist really uh but I got into film and television accidentally and what the only thing I could get into mid-year was a film and television course and um bingo you know I found a thing that brought all the skills together so I would be watching for your real passion you know if you're really genuinely interested in science and you like the visual and the auditory and the, the storytelling. If you like all those things together, then filmmaking could be for you. Um, from there, um, I started working as an, what's called an AD, a first assistant director on feature films, actually. That's why I came to Greece. I was working here uh, a long time ago, 30 years ago, and I met my husband here. Um, and... Uh, but then I started focusing. I made lots of sort of general films, and then I realized I wanted to focus on science filmmaking. And then an I did many detours. So if people out there are wondering about changing gears. One of the things I can really recommend is I think I've made five distinct changes in my career where I've just completely like going from medicine to film and television. Um, and then going from film and television, feature films, I then decided to go and work for CSIRO. That was a big detour, but a bloody good one because it meant that I got to focus on science. Um, mm. And then the ABC came along and then, you know, I got offered an opportunity to run Catalyst for a while and then they bumped me upstairs to senior management for a couple of years. That was terrifying. Um, and uh, I learned a lot, but didn't want to continue that. And then setting up my own business. Um, and that's probably the right, I'm in the right place now, I guess. But the, the thing that I would be watching out for is that combination of an interest in the arts and interest in science. Mm -hmm. You know, so those two things together, uh, as well as the technical knowledge, you need to go and learn how to make films, obviously. And YouTube and films are different. Um, so learning what the difference between short form, longer form, mm -hmm. then feature length and how they, they work, let alone how they funded. Um, that's just a learning curve. Mm. My gosh, there's a million things to ask and no time, but I will just finish with the same question before we move into our big general Q&A session. And that is um, briefly, what's your favorite thing about your job other than spending six months a year in Greece? <laughs> um, I would agree with Belinda that not being bored, uh, that's, that's it. I just don't want to be bored. And this job doesn't allow me to be bored. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing I really get pleasure from is making films so do what I call cross the divide. Um, you're not speaking to the converted. You're not speaking to other people like you that love science. You're getting in audiences that would never watch a science film. You trick them, you coerce them, <laughs> you use other methods to get them to a story of science and half the time they don't know they're watching a science film and that mm. makes me very happy. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. 
Oh, thank you, Sonia. And oh my goodness, can everyone just join me in thanking all of our guests? You can see how incredibly lucky we are to have five people of this calibre managing to fit in today to come and spend a couple of hours with us. I think it's really quite remarkable. I'm incredibly grateful to all of you. Um, we've got about half an hour now to all stay together and ask questions. And massive thanks again to everybody who's already put questions in the chat. I'm going to come to them in a second. But just before we do, obviously, we're, we're really interested in you um, and, and what's brought you to this event tonight. Everyone's time is precious. Two hours is a lot of time. So we just have a couple of quick polls that we would like to ask ask you, which uh, my wonderful friend and colleague Tom, I think is going to share in a moment. First of all, we're just interested in where you are joining us from. How uh, far has our reach managed to be today? So which state are you currently living in? Assuming that you're in Australia, Sonia, I'm guessing you're probably the only person who's joined us from overseas. That gives you very special status. Uh, oh, it's even telling me how many people have responded. How good is that? So a few more people to hear from. No one from the NT, no one from TAS. That's a bit sad, maybe not ideal timing, but there's a pretty good mix there. So we've got lots of Victorians, probably not surprising, so many Victorians, but welcome to everyone who's joining us from WA. I know it's probably not an ideal time for you either. Great to have Queenslanders, South Australians, ACTians, which I'm sure I can't say, but I'm not going to assume that you're all from Canberra um, and New South Wales. So brilliant. Thank you all. The second question we wanted to ask you was, um, oh, sorry, I just realised you probably couldn't actually see that while I was talking through it. I needed to say stop poll. Sorry, that's my fault. Anyway, you can see we have a lovely diverse group of people with us. But the second question we have for you is just to get a bit of a sense of what stage of career are you at at the moment? What are you currently doing? Working, studying, thinking of coming into SciComm, already in SciComm? I'll leave that just for a little bit before we then share the results with you. So what you can't see yet that I can see is that we've got lots of uh, students with us, which is awesome. I mean, what better time to be thinking about what career uh, steps might be ahead of you while you've got um, some time to think and you are still studying. I reckon, Tom, we can probably end it and share with you. So you can see we've got Lots of students with us, welcome, we're delighted to have you. And then people who've been working in, in SciComm for somewhere under three years, all the way up to 11 plus years. And then welcome to the nine people who are currently working outside of science communication, but thinking that this maybe is an area that you'd like to work in. And you've just heard how incredibly diverse different roles in science communication are. So um, that's awesome. I'm so happy that you are all here with us. I think that's absolutely fantastic. The challenging job now is with a little bit less than half an hour that we have, um, is that we've got some really great questions. So thank you again. And I think probably what we should do with the time that we have available um, is stick with the questions that were directed to the whole panel because you will have the opportunity to ask individual questions later. So I'm going to start with, so, so panel, you guys are all uh, highly expert science communicators. You know how this works. You probably don't all need to answer. If you feel like you've got something good to say, please jump in. Let's share it around a bit. But let's um, have the goal of getting through quite a few questions. So let's start with a great question from Patrick, and that is, um, what do you think is the most persistent barrier when trying to communicate science to that general populace. We all wonder how we express that idea, non-scientists, general public, you know, all these terms. Um, oh my gosh, who should I start with? I don't know. Belle, let's go with you. Your job is trying to make science um, accessible to people all over. Yeah, um, look, there are, there are lots of barriers, I guess. Um, but what's the most persistent? I have a bit of think, I think about this one. So I reckon like it's mm, it's knowing where to draw the line between detail and just keeping things simple, stupid, right? Like um, I would love to go into like reams of detail about things, but I know that the reader's not going to want that. 
I'm writing for the ABC. Oh, I'm talking on the radio <laughs> to ABC listeners. Um, they don't need to know the absolute nitty gritty. So it's knowing where to sort of shut up and then just sort of move on, I think, uh, mm-hmm. for me. When reporting things like research news, for sure. Um, in terms of something like a feature, it's finding the story because you do in anything you want to tell the whole the whole idea is storytelling so it's it's kind of like science by stealth like what Sonia was saying before you're telling them a story but you're actually just spoon feeding them a bit of chemistry while you're doing it um and so it's finding that story that carries the reader or the listener through the radio feature or the feature article that you're writing um and that I think once you get that a lot of the barriers come down because you yeah it's a story it's not a lesson. Mm. I don't know if that's really a very good answer. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> Jen, I, think it's, I, I think it's an excellent. Yeah, Sonia, I was going to hand to you next. Over to you, Sonia. But Bella, I think that absolutely answers the question. I think the biggest, the biggest barrier right now globally is doubt and mistrust. Mm-hmm. I think there are so many people, especially post-COVID, post-COVID, we're still in COVID, but you know what I mean, yeah. Um that that don't doubt science and question science and misinformation around science. So personally, I think the biggest barrier to science communication right now, whether it's for me talking to someone down the street or making a film or having dinner with people where science subjects come up, is firstly this perception that it's faith. I, I can't I don't know if anybody else has noticed this recently, but so, you talked about the cathedral, uh, Rachel, Cathedral of Science. And I thought, oh, my goodness, people seem to think that science is just another faith. You can choose to be, uh, to, to follow science if you want. But well, I choose the, not to follow science. Tanya, there's a paper that's just come out that has found that people who really love science have a similar reaction to it than they do to religion. Sorry, that's counting what you're saying. And I totally agree yeah. with you. It's, no, it's no, I, 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 I'm questioning my own faith in science at the moment, and I'm reading quite deeply about it because I've realised that occasionally I go too far into the pro-science and I need to be able to pull myself back, you know, um, and that's really important to keep that distance from the thing that you're reading <laughs> and learning about. But I would say tr- the 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 dampening of trust in science is a very big barrier and the sense that it's not for me. You know, it's too hard. It's over there. But that's more a 1990s to 2020 problem. The the contemporary problem is misinformation and distrust, I think. Mm-hmm. And I, I'd just add to that. I yeah, totally agree, especially coming from a climate change communication um, area originally, that um, distrust and doubt in science and in particular the, the deliberate seeding of that mistrust um, was yeah. what first came to mind as a barrier. But I'd also, having worked with clients, um, and, and finding this uh, a big barrier is, you know, for the communicator or the, the, you know, where the message is starting themselves. So people communicating often don't know, haven't really thought about what their goal is and who their audience is. So I think a big barrier is being really clear on why you're communicating and who you're uh, communicating with or to. Um, mm. So I that uh, barrier. Mm. Um, Brilliant. Thank you. I'm sure everyone has things they could say to that, but I am going to move on so we get through lots of questions. Um, But great question to begin with. Um, I'm going to combine two questions next. And Kat, I'm going to direct it to you first of all. The question is, um, how have you gone about building and maintaining a public persona? What sort of communication have you used when you've um, been engaging the public? You know, we're talking social media or, or other and, and kind of finding your voice combined with a great question from Christine, which is just how important is it to actually build your personal brand in, in science communication? And what is your advice for how to do that successfully? I know everyone has advice, but um, I see Kat every day working on building this brand. So Kat, what, what's your advice? Once I finally, you know, like build this brand, I'll let you know. But um, <laughs> I, I see myself as the singing scientist and that's sort of what I, I say that I am because I think that is my unique voice when it comes to science communication. So building on what Sonia was saying uh, in terms of, you know, find those things that you'd love to do, whether it's like science and, and the audio visual, for me, that was science and music. And so... I decided to start writing songs about science. And when I first started doing that, I thought this is this like silly, who's gonna even be listening to these? Is it too childlike? Um, But I was really happy with with how well they were received. And so I've kind of just run with it. And so I try to 
incorporate that into lots of different things I do. So with, with Jen and myself um, for our students, every week we have weekly update videos and I sing a very, very brief um, little tune about the lessons that we learned that week. Um, for children, I summarize scientific concepts and things like that. And, and I even pitched it to ScienceWorks. And I said, you know, th this is something I do. Would you like me to write songs for you? This would reach your audience. Um, and that's that's gone really well. They, they accepted it. So I think finding what you can do and what you can bring to the table and then putting yourself out there. It can be hard at first, um, and I totally appreciate that, but working out what you can contribute to other people, other organizations um, as you, I think is really important. Um, Clancy, one of our current students, great to have you. Clancy has just given you the vote of confidence, Kat, that they're <laughs> great teaching updates. They're so much more entertaining than if we were just talking. Um, but I think that's awesome advice, Kat. So find something that is you and authentic and that you have some passion around because that is how you can kind of build your brand. Um, other comments from people about the importance of building a brand and how you go about doing it, Rachel? Um, it should be aware that for not all science communication roles do you need to have a public profile because a lot of really um, satisfying roles are behind the scenes. You may not even have a byline, but you're doing some really interesting work. So just bear that in mind if it's not your thing. Mm. Yeah, it's great. hard work. You know, all the social media to build your brand is really hard work and you don't get paid for it. So, mm. Yep, I think that's a really good comment to make. Uh, would anyone else like to share anything about whether it's important or not and how to go about building kind of a public persona? Put a big logo behind you on Zoom meetings. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed that. I'm thinking where's my logo. <laughs> yeah, so branding is important to us as a company to ensure that people have heard the name and, and you know, know us as a science communication company, but maybe I'll just leave it there. Hmm. Excellent. Okay, next question, Rachel, I'm going to send this one to you first. And the comment, the question is um, from Patrick saying that many of the panel hold PhDs. You are one of them, Rachel. Um, but then the comment is that we've seen a reticence from employers about actually hiring people with higher education beyond a bachelor's degree, presumably because they cost more. Um, so I guess it'd be great to hear from each person um, who has a PhD here, or if you don't, you're thinking around that, you know, was it a benefit or a, or a hindrance? In, in early career stages? Did it get you where you got to be or did it matter if you don't have one? Well, I can tell you that there's actually hard evidence that having a PhD does not increase your income. So you should probably know that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it, it goes both ways. And I have to say, it's incredibly galling. Um, I, I've actually had people say they're gonna pay quite a while ago, um, but a top journal that I don't currently work for um, said they're going to pay me less because I had a PhD and everybody knows that PhDs can't write. So, you know, it can get really, that wouldn't be allowed nowadays. But it really, um, PhDs get up people's noses when they don't have PhDs. So it can be quite tricky. On the other hand, I can't tell you how many times I know I'm rolled into a room just because I have a PhD and, you know, meeting with clients or whatever, and people want me because of that. So I really think it's a double-edged sword. I mean, I'm always really glad doing my PhD was one of the happiest three years of or one of the happiest, the happiest three years of my life. So I'm really glad I did it, but I, I could neither recommend it nor recommend nor not recommend it as a sort of um, uh, a career asset. Mm. Interesting, Rachel. Belle, has it ever played a role in anything you've ever wanted to do or done that you decided you didn't want to stay in research longer and do a PhD? No, no, not at all. And at the moment, like the ABC is hiring quite a lot of science journalist jobs and I'm sitting on some of the panels and whether someone's got a PhD or not does not factor into our like consideration so in terms of journalism it's what you can produce um, not what you've done academically hmm. uh, yeah and I, I would have to say you know if you're going to do a PhD you want to be really sure that you want to do that PhD and that there's something that you're so excited about that you really want to spend all of that time doing it but equally it's a huge privilege getting to concentrate on one thing for years I mean Kat for you you obviously couldn't work with me if you didn't have a PhD you couldn't have an academic position at a university without a PhD as much as I would want to I wouldn't be allowed to employ you what, what's your feelings on the benefits or costs of having a PhD um, yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't be able to work with you and that'd be a real shame. So there are some opportunities that are only available to, to people with PhDs. Um, but 
there are also so many opportunities to those without a PhD. So I, I don't sort of like read to it. I don't think you kind of have to go one way or the other. Um, having said that, I learned a lot of skills doing the PhD um, mm -hmm. and I appreciated the time that I had while I was a student. I, I saw that there was one question and I'm not going to try and answer that now, but just while I was doing my PhD, I had many opportunities available to me to, to mentor students, to go into schools and do outreach that maybe I wouldn't have done had I just gone straight into, into the workplace. But um, I think the PhD isn't what you know, makes me a good science communicator. Mm -hmm. Sonia or Simon, you both employ people, have employed lots of people. Any comment to add or has it all been said? I think it's been said. I don't think it makes a difference from my point of view at all. Yep. Nor is it detrimental, but it's not really critical. Yep. Yeah, I'd agree that, that the real sort of the passion and interest in science and the culture of science is really important in uh, employing people and telling those stories. Um, I think a PhD is a great thing to have behind you, but if I'd worked out before my PhD rather than halfway through my PhD that I wanted to do science communication, I probably wouldn't have done it. But having said that, it does help, um, like Rachel said, open the door, um, show that you understand the culture of science. You're not going to short sell the science and communicating it. So having it does help, but it's no way a prerequisite. Yeah. I've also had writers who haven't even got or haven't even haven't got a science degree at all. Um, and I've had a, a few really, really successful science writers that way. Mm. Excellent. I love it. So the answer is if you really want one, it's probably not going to hold you back, but you definitely don't need to do one to progress within science communication, which I think is excellent. Um, the next question I have is from Emily. And Emily, I think you've probably hit the nail on the head and, and asked what a lot of people would like to know the answer to. And that is just what advice do each of you have for actually finding science communication opportunities? So whether that's a job or an internship or even a volunteer role with my ASC hat in, I'm going to jump in straight away and say, you know, please join the ASC. We have a member newsletter with jobs each, each month. We have conferences, we have networking events. You know what they say, you get jobs from the people you know, not from finding it, you know, on a, on a job seeker site or whatever it is. So this community, I would argue, is one of the best ways for you to find those opportunities opportunities but the more ways the more places you look the more likely you are to find something so um yeah and Lucy's um added that Lucy's got lots of volunteer experience but just keep missing out on on actual jobs due to a lack of paid experience so it's that eternal thing of getting stuck you, you're doing everything you can to get the experience but you can't crack that first job and until you crack that first job you're less employable um so yeah and Patrick said what are some specific places people can look rather than just a generic advice of just get out there and make sure people see you um who would like to start? I think this is a really important thing for us to cover. So where should people look if they're trying to get into this field? I just make an observation that may be helpful to people. And then as I've noticed that I'm working at Springer Nature now, which is a huge company, it's 10,000 people. And I've noticed that there's quite a few people that go into, come in as a, say, a journal, junior journal editor or as a project manager. And then they move around the company. And some of those people do become science communicators. And I don't know if that's possible in other companies, but it's that, uh, you know, you can take the quite devious uh, routes to, to get to where you want. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, Rachel, thank you. Belle, over to you. Um, one really good place to find jobs in this space is um, if you join the Science Journalists Association of Australia. So they have, a, I think, a diff, a, like a, a part of the membership for science communicators. And part of that membership, I think it's 80 bucks a year or something, but it, there are lots of jobs and there are some Slack channels where people will put in jobs if they want like someone to write something for, I don't know, a publication they're working on. Um, people will often pop it in there. So it's a really, again, it's kind of like who you know, but mm -hmm. if you can tap into that vein uh, where the editors, where the journalists are um that's a really good place to to get started i think with mm -hmm. with paid work um and there's also lots of tips if you're not if you if you're worried about something or you're not sure how much to charge or all those kinds of things that people are really friendly you know and you can just ask mm. um and people will help you out yeah fantastic other comments sonia over to you um I've got to say, we've had a couple of interns who came in voluntarily who went on to stay with the company and have gone on to really, 
really good uh, careers in science filmmaking. So don't assume that doing an internship leads nowhere. Sometimes it can lead somewhere. Um, the big thing I cannot bear is emails, blanket emails that get sent out. Uh, I just cannot bear it, especially if they haven't watched a single film we've ever made. Um, you know, when I get an email saying, hey, I saw Carbon on ABC and I really thought that was interesting and I'd really love to come and have a chat to you or, you know, can you got 10 minutes for a phone call? Then I go, OK, I might talk to this person, you know, because they've shown that they've actually watched something. Um, and I try to be so polite, but honestly, we, we get so many unsolicited emails I just don't think you should do the blanket email thing do your research work out who you want to really talk to why and these events that you guys hold you know come up and say hello at those they make they make a huge difference I mean Kat that's how we've met over the years Rachel that's how we've met over the years you know it's like it's these events really do allow relationships to blossom but I wouldn't give up on the volunteering I think volunteering is a tried and tested fabulous way of getting a, a start and also a way to do good in the world sorry Kat I'll come to you one sec I, I do a huge, huge amount of volunteer work not because I need a job but just because there are organizations out there that need people with passion and skills who can't necessarily pay people you know people often come up to me and say how do I get a job in radio you've been doing radio for so long how do I get a job in radio I'm like I've been volunteering on radio for 18 years yes I've never been paid a cent I don't ever want to be paid a cent like there are things you can just do because you love it and I get absolutely the privilege I have of earning a salary I totally understand there comes a time when you just have to earn money to pay your bills and your rent I'm not trying to pretend I don't have that privilege but sometimes volunteering can just be a joy in and of itself if you have capacity to give that time so yeah I think volunteering is super important sorry Kat over to you uh, thanks I was just going to jump off from you know Sonia mentioned that we met at an event and I think it's so important when you meet people that you do do that homework as Sonia sort of saying that that sort of pre-work and then the the post follow-up so I messaged um, Sonia and the Gene Pool Productions team and said hey this is the kind of thing I can do I can do social media and we met around the time that Finomania was launched um, another fabulous film it has songs in it um <laughs> but uh, I didn't know you were singing I would have given you a role I didn't know that. <laughs> Damn. Um, but just sort of that that connection and that idea of oh can I do a little bit of work for you and and I volunteered um but then that led to work later on um same I met Simon at an event and then I did a little bit of work for Scientel so I think, you know, just putting yourself out there, I've gone on a lot of coffees with people. I'm a Melbourneian who doesn't drink coffee, but I've had a lot of coffees with people. Um, <laughs> and sort of thinking about what can I do for you? And that's how I got um, the RSV job. And I did start off by volunteering and then kind of thought about what my worth is. And I think sort of as, as you progress through your career, um, you do need to make a living. And so thinking about um, sort of what what Belle was talking about, working out how much you should be charging. It's it's a big thing. Um, so having mentors to support you and, and guide you through that process is great. But start to then think, I actually have a skill that I can offer to people. Let's have a chat about it. Can I do something for you? And will you pay me for it? Mm. Yeah. And it takes some courage, right? Those conversations absolutely take some courage. But at some point, if this is something you really want to do and you really believe in, you've got to kind of step up and own it and say, well, what's the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen is people will either never respond, at which point it's not personal. They're just really busy. Or they'll say, no, I mean, welcome to life, right? Rejection is absolutely part of it. And sometimes something great may may happen. Kat got her job with us because we had come across her at events. We'd seen her, we'd chatted with her. All of a sudden we needed someone we could appoint really quickly to pick up a teaching role. Literally, I can't even remember how I got your phone number, but somehow I got Kat's phone number, rang her up and said, Kat, do you have any capacity to do some work? And that's led into what now, three years of, of you know, working just because she's so good at what she does but if we hadn't seen her around the place and known that she put herself forward for things you know it never would have happened so be brave I think is part of the message here um I've got time for a very quick story Jen yes go for it uh, people might know Veritasium Derek Muller 11 million subscribers on YouTube last time I looked maybe he's got more now 
he when he was starting out he sent me a, an email with a couple of videos that he'd made for youtube long before he had his veritasium channel saying hey i'm a phd physics student la 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 this is what i want to do and i watched his videos and i was blown away and at that time i was head of specialist factual at the abc and i had no way of plastic placing this i tried to find a spot for him in catalyst i tried to not know there was nowhere to put him and i had to say look your work's fabulous but i can't do anything you know good luck uh at, Fast forward, you know, uh, 10 years, not 10 years, seven years, something like that, six years. And he's got his YouTube channel at that stage, 4 million subscribers. And I need a presenter for a Uranium documentary series. We had a woman that we wanted to be the presenter of it. But our various broadcast partners said, nope, we want a bloke, we want a bloke. And I fought and I fought and I fought <laughs> and I lost. Five broadcast partners, you have to go. Anyway, I said, I'll only put forward one guy. And it's this dude that does his YouTube videos. And I and it went back to this email he'd sent me, I don't know how many years ago, five years ago. Uh, and I just never forgot him, right? Because his videos were so damn good. And um, that was his first big TV gig. Not that he needed us. His YouTube channel is totally self-sufficient. In fact, he lost money making films. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, but it was fantastic for us because we got to get him out there and, and now he's doing whatever he wants, you know, globally. But I just remember thinking that that video and that approach he made me was not wasted because he mm. was that good. just burrowed its way into my head somewhere. Mm. Oh, I think that's a great story, Sonia. And it, it's just all about, you know, you're a person and the people you're trying to connect with and find potential opportunities with, they are people. It's about being a decent human being. I think it's about being respectful. It's about being kind. It's about valuing people's time. It's about actually making connections with people. And yes, it takes courage, but you know, you've got to start somewhere. Um, there's so many questions I want to put to you and we're almost out of time because the breakout rooms are important. But um, there's one question that I really do want to get to. In fact, there's two that I really want to get to. Um, but just before I do quickly, Tom's just added to me in the chat that um, one of the huge values of volunteering and doing internships is the fact that it gives you things to add into your CV. You know, if you're looking at the difference between saying, no, no, I've never led a team when you're applying for things versus yes, I led a team as a volunteer with Pint of Science, for example. So really don't underestimate even if you're feeling frustrated that you know volunteering after volunteering after volunteering please will someone pay me you know building a cv is a really useful thing to do uh, but the question i do really want to get to is from camilla and a few other people have joined in and this is just um, a question around diversity and inclusivity in science communication in Australia. Um, how inclusive is it or could it be? So we've got some international science communicators here or international scientists here who would really like to have a career in Australia, but feel really uncertain and fearful <laughs> about what opportunities there might be for international science communicators. We don't have time for everybody to answer. Sonia, should I start with you, given that you do a, spend a lot of time working with international audiences? Yeah, look, I, I've got to tell you, at the moment, we actively seek people who are not middle-aged white men, with all due respect to middle-aged white men. Um, so um, it's a really important thing. We're all very aware of it. Obviously, it's skill-based, um, it's story-based, but um, I think there's a huge push for diversity. Is it enough? No. No. Um, I, you know, I make a point in every film, making sure we always have lots of female scientists. I've been doing that for 25 years. You know, it was a small thing, but it was, and I do female voiceovers for the same reason, because I just want to stop having this male voice of science. Um, and that's less of a problem now than it was, say, 15 years ago. Um, but absolutely, there's opportunities. Um, in fact, at the risk of sounding naff, it's trendy. So go for it. Grab it. Run with it. Anyone else got a quick comment to add other than... Have faith. We want you. Um, I mean, there are additional barriers if you're writing English as a second language. Mm -hmm. So that makes it more tricky because your English, unless you're totally bilingual, may not be up to may not be at the same level as somebody who's a native English speaker. But I do see at companies like the one I'm working at, at the moment, you know, we're seeing the increasing uh, understanding that science has got to become truly global and it has got to be able to embrace um, people who are working in languages other than English. So I do see there will be an increase in the need for people who are bilingual. And I spend a lot of time working with writers who, it is unbelievable they do this, their first language is Chinese and they are writing in English. And their English, of course, isn't perfect. 
but I need them to be able to interview Chinese scientists. So I'm very happy to, to deal with that. And I think we're going to see that increasingly as we realize that science is being done in many other places than English speaking countries. So I do think it will be increased. I, uh, I am also just wondering, you know, there must be publications in Australia that are in languages other than English. And who's doing the science for those publications? Mm. Just a thought. Mm. Um, excellent. I know there's a lot more we could probably say to that, but I hope the key message that you've received is, yes, there are definitely opportunities. And um, as somebody who um, brings diverse experiences, languages, um, perspectives, you know, I think we all have a sense that that's what science communication really needs. So I hope that you find support um, and kindness in Australia. I want a one word answer from each of you before we jump into our first breakout. So everyone here, please be thinking about who you want to jump into a breakout room with. These people are all absolutely remarkable. Um, we want you to be able to choose, but if every single person goes into one room, obviously that's a huge waste of everyone else's time. So please understand we may do a little bit of manual moving around. I'm really certain that you're going to find wonderful um, wisdom from every person, but let's just see how the numbers pan out. We have no idea. But just before that breakout room, so Tom, in just a second, we're going to be ready. But Clancy's just asked a question. I'd love to hear from each of you in literally like a sentence or less. What online platform do you think is, um, Clancy's words are um, popping off at the most, the most at the moment? Like what platform do you think is really important in SciComm at the moment? LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Belle, your pick, what, what platform would you say is a good place to be right now? And I know you could talk about it for a long time, but if you just had to pick one quickly, what would you pick? YouTube, because podcasts are moving to YouTube too. Okay, beautiful. YouTube, Kat, I'm just going to go in order that you are in my screen, Kat. Um, can I not say one, but like whatever is the best platform for you, like in terms of whatever medium you're producing. Beautiful. So know your audience, know your platform. Simon, what, what do you think? Uh, well, look, I've just, I guess LinkedIn is important to, to me, but I'd really like to see LinkedIn move away from all the, you know, virtue signaling and how you know, great your business is and, uh, and be more, you know, taking the place of what Twitter used to be about telling mm. you know, short stories. Yep. Beautiful, Simon. Rachel, where do you reckon it's at? WeChat, because China has just passed America in terms of its output of science and SciComm in China goes on WeChat. Mm. Excellent. I love it. Sonia, to you. Um, I'd have to say YouTube as well. I think YouTube is where we're going to place a lot more of our films from now on. And when we've released on YouTube uh, for a small fee, we've made more money than if we make a film through the usual process. So I think YouTube is an untapped area for filmmakers like me who do long form. Interesting. Brilliant. All right, team, um, thank you once again. So many great questions, so many absolutely fabulous responses. I do feel like we could spend an hour all together, but we have promised people access to be able to ask you questions. I'm sorry I didn't go to any individual questions in the chat. Thank you to people who did put in questions as we went through all, each speaker. Um, I hope you'll agree we used our time more effectively to have some broader conversations, but you will have the chance now to ask your question of individual people. So this is where I say, Tom, it's all over to you, my friend. I have faith. Um, hopefully you are receiving invitations to join breakout rooms. Um, I'm just gonna kind of let it happen. Join your breakout room. Uh, you get to choose. So, um, so Tom, everyone, you, you do it, you do it. Yeah, so everyone, you will have the option to join a room. We've named the rooms by the first name of the, the, the person we've thrown into that room. Go join somewhere, have a chat with someone. Um, please do, uh, if, if you do notice that there's lots of people on in one room, perhaps you can jump back out here and go somewhere else. Um, if I see that there's any rooms that are completely empty, I'll throw some people in there. But already I can see that all the rooms have got at least one person. Yeah, beautiful. So jump in. You'll have 15 minutes to ask people questions. Have fun and enjoy.